Game 12 of the World Chess Championship between Ding Liren and Yan Nishi. Time running out for Ding in this 14-game match, but in the past we've seen some extraordinary games close to the finish in these matches. Kasparov hitting back against Karpov in Seville 87. We've had Kramnik winning a last round game against Leko. Uh, Carlsen left it pretty late against Karyakin. So, Ding not without hope. Let's see how he got on in this 12th game. So, Ding with white opens with d4, knight f6. Knight f3, d5, and then e3 from Ding. So, a much quieter start. Uh, than we've seen in previous games. Not even a London system. You know, this pawn blocks in the bishop. So this is a very pragmatic start from Ding. He wants to avoid any long theoretical lines. This is uh, the so-called collar opening, named after the, the dashing Belgian player Edgard Collar, who launched some fantastic kingside attacks with this opening. C5. But this, of course, is the problem. It's a very modest start, and black can start to uh, attack the centre. Knight d2. So this could conceivably go into some kind of Queen's Gambit accepted reversed, taking here, and then a3 and b4, and then c4. This is, this is interesting. But Nepo decided to just exchange on d4. And so now we have this very familiar so-called Carlsbad structure that arose in the London system game way back um, in the match. Except this knight is blocking the bishop on c1, so that's a little bit unusual. But the structure is very similar to that we've seen before. Queen c7 from Nepo. Um, of course, the queen often belongs on this square in, in this opening, looking down this diagonal. But there's certainly no need to play the queen there immediately. Um, but Nepo played it quite quickly. No doubt some supercomputer has said that this was a good idea. But, I mean, bringing the knight out instead seems reasonable. C3. Okay, so Ding sets up this nice pawn structure, very solid. And now I would have expected knight c6 here. But bishop d7, now this is, to my eyes, very curious indeed. Normally, this bishop could be expected to develop on f5 or g4. So bishop d7, honestly, I cannot give you an explanation for this move. It looks very strange. And in fact, if I were white here, I'd be very, very tempted just to play knight e5 and even sometimes swipe that bishop. But Ding played bishop d3, which also looks very reasonable, because now he's managed to claim this diagonal. Knight c6 and castles. And here, Nepo played bishop g4. So, listen, if anyone out there can uh, explain this to me, I'd be very grateful, because I certainly don't know why black has lost a tempo like this. I don't know the, the rationale behind this at all. We now have a, a pretty normal position, very similar to Queen's Gambit exchange variations with colours reversed, of course. Rook e1, e6, and now the knight switches round to the king side, possibly to g3, possibly to e3, depends how black plays. Bishop d6. I mean, uh, even though Nepo has lost the tempo, this is certainly not a bad position for black. The queen and bishop have claimed this diagonal. And compared to normal the normal London system, I suppose you could say that's an achievement. You know, this bishop still needs to find a decent diagonal. So it's not that it hasn't worked out badly for Nepo, just that tempi aren't so important in this position. Well, a pretty standard move here is knight g3, controlling this square, and that means that white is threatening h3. I suspect Ding didn't like the look of h5, because black still has the option to castle queenside. There you go. Maybe that's why black uh, 
donated a tempo because it, the king hasn't committed to the king's side yet, so he can still go to the queen's side. Who knows? That's, this is just speculation. Anyway, instead of knight g3, which I think is reasonable actually, in spite of h5, um, Ding played bishop g5, put some pressure on the knight on f6. And again, black could castle queen's side here actually, it's not, not terrible. But Nepo played castles kingside, and that's also very reasonable. Ding had a big think here. And he decided to accept the invitation to complicate and exchange on f6. If you want to play something um, more positional, more strategic, one could play with bishop h4 and bring the bishop round to g3. Exchanging off this nice bishop, and I mean, that's a very reasonable way for white to play. But bishop f6, g takes, obviously, this damages the pawn structure on the king's side, and Ding is looking to unbalance the position. He wants to play for a win. And now knight g3, so that controls the h5 square. Sometimes, you know, this maneuver is quite nice. Nepo played f5, blocking out the bishop, which looks very reasonable. In fact, there was a, a dangerous alternative here. Black could play king h8 with the idea of rook g8, and if h3, you know, you want to try and get black to, to exchange on f3, in fact, black can sacrifice, and this is a very powerful attack. White can make a draw, I won't go into details, but uh, yeah, white has to be careful there. So king h8 was a, a very dangerous alternative, but f5 is logical. Shutting out the bishop. Ding played h3, so the knight guards the h5 square, so black has to exchange on f3. And now, again, king h8 is possible, but I suspect that, uh, with the idea of rook g8, I, I suspect that Nepo was a little bit concerned about this sacrifice. It's not so stupid, and either rook e6 or queen d5 here. In fact, black is okay, but I can understand why Nepo played knight e7 to guard f5, but also it's very logical. You want to swing the knight around to the king's side, get some initiative, and protect the king as well. But white has play two, knight h5. King h8, of course. Black wants to play rook g8. And actually, you know, white's attack. White isn't doing much here when you can look at the difference between the bishops. The white bishop on d3 is blocked by the pawn. Look at black's bishop. So really, white has to be terribly careful here. Ding lashed out with g4, but with the king at the end of the g-file, then that's quite double-edged. King h1. Knight g6. Now that's an important move. This knight manages to swing to this excellent square h4. And here white should play rook g1 and, and chances are balanced. But instead Ding played bishop c2. And that's a mistake because after this black took the initiative. Rook g6. Now, it's important to see what happens if white takes on f5. That's the obvious move. In fact, rook g2 is incredibly powerful. All these pieces coming into the, the attack. So, for example, okay, here's, here's a desperate counter-attack, but in fact, this loses in short order. Let me just show you this. Check here, and I do believe that one wins. And rook g2 followed by queen takes e2. That looks like mate, doesn't it? Yeah. So after rook g6, taking on f5 simply isn't possible. So rook g1, yeah, looks looks normal to guard the g-file here. But then f4, attacking the queen. Queen d3. And now an excellent move from Nipomnichi. Queen e7. Just swinging over to the king's side. And black's pieces look so dangerous here. And wh where exactly is white's counterplay coming? Rook e1. Queen g5. 
So black wants to swing the rook to g8, play the rook to h6, play f3, maybe sacrifice on on uh, h5. I mean, this is really, really dangerous. Uh, yeah, I mean, not to mention f3 and, and, you know, something simple like knight g2 or knight somewhere else. So Ding in massive trouble here. And he was behind on the clock just to add to his troubles here. So he played c4. So he really needs to stir up trouble. He needs to complicate somehow. And considering that black's pieces have swung over to the king side, then I suppose this is a reasonable try. The only problem is that after pawn takes pawn, which Nepo played, queen takes pawn, knight f3. A simple fork. And this is just fantastic for black. Um, taking here doesn't have quite the same effect because after black recaptures, then this knight is in trouble. But after pawn takes pawn, Ding played queen c3. So this is the idea. He's trying to maybe create something on this diagonal. So I think, you know, this is why he put the rook to e1 because things might just open up. But it's it's a bit desperate. Oh, the other reason for rook e1, of course, is after queen check, then you can play the, the bishop to e4. So Nepo, quite understandably, just thought, OK, I'll protect the pawn. Why not? <clears throat> a4, ding, looking to uh, undermine, but... Well, I mean, black could even play a6 here, and that's certainly not not bad. But Nepo saw something forcing. It's interesting, at this point, Ding had obviously sort of clicked into gear, realised that he had a really poor position, and started moving quickly. But the thing is, Nepo followed suit. He also started playing quickly. Now, not that these moves were bad, but when you've got a good position, there's no need to play quickly. He had enough time to think things through. As I said, not that these moves were bad. Uh, he played rook g8. Feels natural to swing this one over. He could have played knight f3. Now, I can understand why you wouldn't want to do this if you're just glancing the position without too much calculation because after queen c6 that queen attacks rook bishop and knight and there's a lot going on here that rook is also attacked so this needs very careful calculation but in fact this does end up in a good position for black but even you know even a move like this is still quite tricky um, but there's a very long line here. I, let me show you this very quickly. This, this is not a human line um, and it and needs massive calculation. In fact, black has a superb position here. This is attacked. Uh, it's very hard for white to defend. Watch this one. And again, a computery move. Um, you only play f5 if you're absolutely sure that this is winning. Because it obviously it opens up the king, but in fact it is very, very strong. And, and here's the justification, because after this you can exchange, and then you exchange everything off, and you play b3, followed by bishop a3, and this one can run home. In fact, this knight can come back and grab the b-pawn, but obviously in this position with two extra pawns, black should be winning. Okay, that was a long, very complicated line. I'm I'm not even suggesting that um, Nepo should see this move or, or ought to calculate that long variation. I'm just saying he didn't spend much time at this point. It might have been worth a deeper look. And as I said, you know, there are lots of branches in this position. One has to also consider, well, what happens if white simply ditches the exchange? Black holds everything together, but white certainly has compensation there. Well, okay, black black should be winning. 
Um, but Nepo was playing quickly. Rook g8. And again, Ding was playing very quickly too. He could take on g6. He'd obviously just sort of thought this just is never very good. Um, but it's in fact, it's not that clear. I mean, I won't go into detail. But quickly, Ding played queen c6, attacking the bishop. And Nepo played very quickly. He played bishop to b8. The bishop was attacked. He moved it back. So he's just... Nepo's playing on feeling here. Whereas this position really needs just calculation. You just got to get it right. Um, he has a good move here. Not an obvious move. A very tricky move that requires detailed calculation and that's knight f5 okay what's the point of this well if pawn takes knight queen takes pawn threatening here is very powerful and after this well this is going to be a winning position basically uh, with these dual threats and what else if bishop takes then this is very good for black the rook protects the bishop, and if rook e8, in fact, queen h4 is a strong move again, attacking here. It's not, I mean, this, these moves are not at all obvious. Um, and if playing the bishop back, then, in fact, then one should play the bishop back here. Um, it, it's really complicated. But bishop b8 was certainly a mistake. And if, but the funny thing is, Ding did not take advantage of it. Ding, at this point, could have taken on g6. Now, this is very interesting because over the last few moves, this capture was available. And Ding had obviously just blocked it out of his mind. He obviously just thought, well, you know, I can't even entertain this possibility because it just looks really weird because now the knight is in trouble. But here... White has a very strong move, d5. And this really upsets black's position. So I should repeat, this did not happen, but d5 is very strong. So first of all, well, what about queen takes? Well, in fact, this just leads to a winning endgame for white because the knight has escaped and white is the exchange ahead. Okay, so what about... Let me see... What else have we got? Well, pawn takes, again, allows that knight in, you know, or queen, queen f6, uh, just head straight for the endgame. So what about taking the knight here? Well, in this case, white breaks through the middle. And, in fact, this is now winning for white. So, for example, if queen takes, then, well... That looks pretty awful. Um, this this rook will follow up. And here's the trick after queen d5 check. Take. And rook e8 picks up that bishop. So bishop takes followed by d5. That was the key move. That's the easy one to overlook. But as I said, clearly Ding had just blocked this capture out of his mind and went for queen b7 instead, which, to be fair, is a very reasonable idea. So it keeps tabs on the bishop, it attacks f7, it also attacks b4. But the funny thing is, this move, knight f5, is still a very powerful move, making way for the queen to come to h4. Still really strong. But instead, well, Nepo was on tilt. He played rook h6. So he has ideas, perhaps, at some point of taking here. But bishop b4. There's a, a careful move from Ding. So he just wanted to bring this bishop over to guard the diagonal and perhaps to defend his king at some point as well. At this point... 
the engine evaluation is basically roughly level. But to my eyes, this is a much easier position for white to play than black, because if black doesn't break through on the king side, then these pieces are really offside, actually. And white actually has pretty good coordination, you know. And this knight is is very dangerous, looking at these squares. And the queen is on the prowl at the other side of the board. So I think it's, a, it, as I said, much easier for white to play than black. And now, in fact, the engine likes f3, but I would say, you know, are you really going to consider this when queen f7 is such an obvious riposte and there's no very obvious move uh, for black here. In fact, the, the engine likes knight g2, but, well, you know, even if white just ditches the exchange here, I think I would far prefer to play white than black in this position. But roughly level is still the assessment. Anyway, bishop e4 just played. Rook f8 from Nepo, guarding the pawn. Queen takes pawn. So now... Yes, white is a pawn up, if I'm not mistaken. And why not? You take a pawn and you threaten to take a rook. Seems seems like a bargain. And Nepo fell back with the queen. Now it's obvious that things have gone badly wrong here for black. Queen c3. Looking down at the king. Looks very reasonable. You know, it'd be nice to try and get that king into the g-file because that really will uh, leave black very poorly placed. Knight g6, the knight comes back. Wants to make way for the queen. And Ding played a very pragmatic move here. I mean, it feels like d5 check should be the right move because e5 feels very anti-positional, blocking out the bishop, giving white control over f5. Uh, Bishop b5 is possible, but still, this looks very nice for white. But Ding played a very careful move, bishop g2. So just making sure that h3 is protected. And indeed, Nepo threw the queen back to the king side, threatening the f2 pawn, rook e2. So white is, is very solidly placed here. Um, and, you know, Ding was moving quickly. Not massive time pressure. I think he had something like 10 or 11 minutes remaining for to get to the time control. Six moves remaining. And here something extraordinary happened. Nepo still had a reasonable amount of time on the clock. From memory, something like 14 or 15 minutes. So he had time to think, to find some some little tricky way of playing. Uh, queen g5, according to the engines, is is the way to go. I mean, not not an obvious move. It's funny that this kind of toing and froing of the queen along this diagonal uh, still feels like an easier position for white to play than black. You know, I would still want to look at d5 check. I like the knight on h5. But incredibly, in this position, Nepo played f5. Well, this move is either very good or very bad because it blows up black's position. Now, if you blow up whites and you get there first, very good. But this is very bad. I have no idea what Nepo had overlooked, but Ding, after a little thought, took on e6, and black's position collapses completely. There is no breakthrough for black. White is about to check along this diagonal. So, for example, f takes g4. Let's give a check. d5. Watch out for queen g7 mate. So, well, I mean, black can play like this, but this is, of course, completely lost. You can, you can just take, take this and, and white is a piece ahead or play d6. Okay, what else is there? f3. Again, let's throw in d5 check if we can... Mate here, that's fine. Knight e5. I mean, there are many ways to play this. You you can actually just take on e5 here, but you can do this as well. This is actually winning. It's it's uh, it's not a big deal because after this, you can you can play this. 
cutting off the bishop's defense of the knight. This is absolutely winning for white. What else is there? Um, I mean, it's gone. It really has gone. Nepo played rook takes h5, which was taken. Queen takes and d5 anyway. Check. King g8. And now d6. Excellent move. Just powering through. And the bishop is ready to come to d5. And the king really has no hiding place in this position at all. Black's position has just collapsed through the middle. I mean, it's just a shocking end. Um, but extraordinary from Jan Nepomnishi because he just played on tilt at a certain point. You know, in this position where it's starting to get very complicated, obviously black is doing well here, but at this point you just have to calculate, you have to find a clear way through. But once he started playing very quickly, then he was making mistakes. I mean, both players were making, you know, mistakes if you're looking at it you know absolutely objectively but somehow the way that Nepo was playing with these moves that gave Ding very obvious repost like Queen here hitting the rook um Nepo was playing some really poor moves some very poor decisions and Ding was the one that held it together so that in this position yeah He's he's got a sound position here for the first time in in a long time basically, in this game. Wow, it was, it was very interesting to hear the players afterwards. Um, I, I should say that in this position, Nepo resigned. Just to be absolutely clear, Black resigned. Um, interesting to listen to the players afterwards. I mean, Nepo was dis well the board he was distraught. Um, actually, he held it together very very well during the press conference. Uh, but Ding said, you know, the players were asked about their nerves, and Ding said, well, I'm not so nervous today. He said it was totally silent in the playing hall, um, and somehow he didn't feel like anyone was watching the game, <laughs> and he had to tell himself, well, this is, you know, this is a very important game. Um, and he realised that he was lost at some moment, but, you know, kicked into overdrive, so fair play. Scores, six all, with two games to go. This is developing into a fantastic match, it really is. So we will have all 14 games, regardless of what happens in the next game. We will have all 14 games. It's wide open. Do join me for coverage of the next game, which takes place tomorrow. And if you're not a subscriber, click that button. If you want to support the channel, do check out patreon.com. Thanks for watching.